So, Mr. George Magoon, would you come forward, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the love of the hands of the nation that is alive, that is death and justice for all. Thank you. I'm not sure how I got here, but uh, I did this for the group in Akron uh, earlier this year. and Somehow my name uh, drifted out here to Medina. But uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll try to be, uh, to speak up. Is that better? Yes, sir. OK, I'll just lean a little closer to this. Uh, my name is George Magoon. I was born in Akron. Uh, my dad was a chemist, and he took the road back to West Virginia, and that's where we grew up. Uh, as a boy, I grew up. I spent 20, 25 years down in a town called Nitro, West Virginia. And maybe some of you know where it is. Uh, I enlisted in the Navy when I was just about to turn 18 because my parents would not sign the papers before to allow me to go in. Uh, I ended up going to uh, boot camp up at Great Lakes. When I finished there, I went to Memphis to the aviation training school. I was going to be uh, a gunner on a uh, Navy uh, plane. And they found out that I was red, green, colorblind. And so they wouldn't let me up in the airplanes. And they told me I could be a mechanic mate working on the planes. And as I went through the process of signing up to go to school in Memphis, uh, I found that most of the Navy people there weren't very happy with the way things were run at the base. So I backtracked and uh, they got very upset with me and sent me to New Orleans. And they said I'd be chipping paint all day, which did not happen. And we, uh, the, uh, well, one of the boatswain's mates, uh, or yeoman, I mean, uh, supplied me with an extra ID card and we went into New Orleans uh, every night. And so that wasn't too hard a duty to handle. And from there, my name was called on the loudspeaker. And I went over to, their, to the office. And they asked me if I'd like to be on a destroyer. And I said, that sounds all right to me, because people were being shipped everywhere. They were even shipping some of them to the base south of San Diego, where they traded all their Navy uniforms in for <clears throat> Marines uniforms. And I decided I didn't want that. So when they offered me a uh, service on a destroyer or what, I took it. I went from there to, to uh, San Francisco to Treasure Island, where we trained to uh, do all the things necessary on a destroyer and then up to Bremerton, Washington, where the ship was being built. And from there, we went back to uh, San Diego on ship shakedown. And from there, we went to Pearl, from Pearl to uh, Manus, the Admiralty Islands, uh, which is about 90 miles north of Hollandia, New Guinea. Uh, only thing that occurred on the way down there is we were all initiated into the shellback. We're no longer polywogs now. Maybe some of you have been through that uh, initiation, but uh, sometimes it depends upon the ship you're on as to uh, what they do to you or, or what happens during that day. I can remember the ugliest thing that happened is 
uh, they saved the uh, garbage for about, I don't know, three or four days, and they let it sit out in the sun. Now, the this, this sun we're talking about, it's right on the equator, and it's quite warm. And we had to crawl through that tube. It was in a canvas tube, and they spread that garbage out from one end to the other, and you had to crawl through it. Now, that's what we, we did on, on our, our tin can, uh, the 593. Uh, it wasn't very pleasant, but we all managed to, to survive that day. Uh, from there, we went out along New Guinea uh, checking to make uh, sure that, that the uh, Japanese hadn't sneaked back in to uh, occupy some of the islands that had already been captured. And uh, uh, if they'd, you've heard stories about uh, the beautiful South Sea Island girls, don't believe it. <laughs> Just don't believe it because they would come out to our ship and, and uh, dug out bum, bum, bum boats or whatever you want to call them and they smile at you and they chewed betel nut which turned their mouth all red and so when they're smiling up at you all you see is this big ugly red mouth <laughs> and it's <laughs> if you've been longing for the South Sea Island beauties, uh, that'll turn you off right now. Uh, from there, we went back to Hollandia, and we escorted the uh, invasion fleet for the Philippines, which was to land at Leyte. Uh, we went in close, I think maybe there was four or five feet, maybe ten feet, uh, clearance with the bottom of the hull to give close support, gun support. We had five five-inch guns aboard our ship and five quad 40s and seven 20 millimeters. Uh, we went in close to support the uh, army that was landing there. Uh, one bright spot, or maybe some of you don't feel this way, but uh, uh, MacArthur landed that day on, he went ashore and he went right by our ship. I could have hit him with a slingshot, but uh, he, he marched through the water and up on the beach. So we did see MacArthur there. Uh, on about four days on the 25th, or no, yeah, the 25th, we went through down to Sergal Straits, and there were destroyers lined up on both sides of the straits. Uh, the Japanese fleet was coming uh, up the straits and headed for the uh, landings. They wanted to destroy the transports and the army that was landing at, uh, at, on Lake Agolf. There were three, three different points where they landed. Uh, the uh, battle in Sergal Straits took place oh, about three o'clock in the morning, I think it was. Uh, uh, my position aboard the ship was uh, uh, daytime. Uh, I was uh, gun director on the, the uh, starboard uh, twin 40s and at nighttime of course you couldn't use the direct gun director because at nighttime just shut them down and I was transferred I went from there to the searchlights and mind you were making torpedo runs on a Japanese battleship and all I can think of was God Lord, please don't have me turn these things on. <laughs> I just, I just didn't feel it would be a good place to uh, be with the searchlights going. Uh, that night we made three torpedo runs, 
we fired five torpedoes one night. I mean, the first, first leg. And three of them hit the Japanese battleship, the Yamashiro, which the captain later said when he was interviewed in Japan is that the ship broke in half and sunk almost immediately. Uh, we turned around and came back and fired three torpedoes at a heavy cruiser and none of them hit because the cruiser turned out of the way. And then we came back and ran again, uh, firing two torpedoes, uh, and one of them hit a light cruiser. We, we don't know how much damage was done to it, but it did hit it, because being, well, my p position on the searchlights was, was like a 50-yard line at a football game. You could see both sides. You could see everything that was going to, that happened that night. Uh, and I don't, don't know what, how much damage was done to the cruiser, but I don't know how much uh, you people know about uh, destroyers and torpedo runs, but uh, usually uh, we have about one. You make one torpedo run and you're lucky if you come out of the end of it uh, still in one piece. So uh, we made three that night, so we contributed uh, <laughs> more than our share, I think, of the torpedoes that night. But there were an awful lot of torpedoes in that run, uh, that water that night. Uh, there were at eight destroyers on each side of, of the Sirgao Strait. Now, I'm not sure how many torpedoes were in the water <laughs> at one time, but there, there were a, a whole bunch of them. And the, the whole Japanese fleet, except for a light cruiser and a heavy cruiser, I think was sunk that night. And uh, of course they give all the uh, uh, casualties or to the uh, ships that were battleships that were raised off of Pearl Harbor. And I think it was all due to propaganda. Uh, so that uh, they used that as a the revenge for these, just, I mean, the battleships that were sunk at Pearl Harbor. And I would not sure, but I have no way of finding out, is there's possibility that there were n no uh, armor-piercing shells aboard any of these battleships. They were just there for uh, troop support with explosive shells to uh, they were able to fire 20 to 22 miles inland. Uh, but that was a long night. And uh, I hope I never have to live through it again. But uh, I think about f four days later, we got the honor of uh, of witnessing the, the first kamikaze attack of the war. We had seven kamikazes attacked us, one coming from all directions. And we shot down four of them, but uh, three of them got away, and one of them left us with a great big hole in the forecastle on the uh, number two magazine. It was a 500-pound bomb, I think, that what it had. And uh, why the magazine didn't blow up, well, nobody will ever know. If the magazine had blown up, I wouldn't be here talking to you because my battle station was right up above that magazine. So uh, I was able to, the next day, I know I was able to, to go all the way up to the, to the forecastle, right up to the very front of the ship and drag, put my feet in the water. So we came very close to sinking. Uh, uh, we lost 17 shipmates that day. And 
we didn't sink and the tug came alongside and we put a patch on it uh, and we went back to Manus and we went to Admiralty Islands and they put us in a dry dock with another destroyer and the uh, cruiser, Australian cruiser, the Shropshire. Then it was back to the States with, we escorted the Iowa, the Iowa had dropped a screw and was coming back to Pearl to get a new, sh they didn't have a, a dry dock there large enough to handle a battleship. And I don't know whether any of you has been close to one of those modern battleships like the Iowa, but it is really huge especially when you're alongside of it trying to fuel. Uh, you just are surprised by just how large those new battleships that we put out, the Iowa and the Massachusetts and the North Carolina and the Missouri and a bunch of those. But uh, we went back out and we went back to Manus and then we went up to Manila and we had Liberty in Manila. It was, they were still fighting the Japanese in, in, in Manila, and they were, would tell you where you could go and where you're not. And I'd, my friend and I, we just decided to go back to the ship. It sounded like a better deal. <laughs> but uh, we then went to uh, town of Barrio and we we gave support for the troops landing, the Australian troops and the Dutch troops landing in Barrio because the, they wanted the oil that they got out of Barrio. And there's one thing about Barrio, it is just about the hottest place in the world. You have no idea how hot it can be. You could just, well, they, I know you heard it before, but you could fry an egg on the deck. It was, that's just how hot it got you. You could feel the warmth of the deck through your shoes when you, when you walked you know, down the deck. So uh, we thought we were going to go to Okinawa when we went back to Manila and we escorted uh, General MacArthur. He was aboard the Phoenix around to all of the islands in the Philippines and he would get off his, his cruiser and get aboard a PT boat and zip around the harbor and go aboard and go on shore and find the mayor and pass out matchboxes with, if you opened them up, it said, Hi. his picture was there and, and it said, I have returned. So. Uh, I acquired a whole box of those matches and uh, somebody uh, removed them from my locker, so uh, I don't know really what happened to them, but I would like to have them today. <laughs> uh, from that point in Borneo, after we went back to Borneo one more time, and uh, from there we went to Alaska from Borneo to Alaska. You can imagine the change in the temperature. It was tremendous. But on the way up to Alaska, Attu was where we ended up. Uh, we uh, stopped to search for survivors of the cruiser in Indianapolis. And I know you've all heard that story about not knowing that the ship was going from Guam, you know, to Subic Bay. And uh, that's where the sharks ate up a lot of those sailors that were in the water. But we, did, we didn't find any uh, survivors of the in Indianapolis. And we went from there to uh, Guam and the B B-29s were taken off right over our ship and they are loud. They are just one loud airplane. 
and it looked like they weren't going to really get in the air <laughs> because they were so big, and they'd fly right right over the ship. From there, we went to up to ADAC, and halfway up there, the war ended, which we all celebrated. <laughs> uh, outside of that, uh, there's not much to my story. They, people would uh, ask me uh, what I did aboard ship, and I told them I was a fire controlman. Uh, and they, sometimes they'd get a blank look on their face. Sometimes they wouldn't. And when I'd see that blank look, I'd say, well, I walked around with asbestos old shoes, stomping out cigarette butts. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, that left them kind of <laughs> nothing to say. I can, can tell you one other little story is that after the battle down in Syracuse Straits, uh, we looked for survivors. And of course, the only survivors that day were, would be Japanese sailors. And uh, we found one. We f found one floating, floating on a piece of debris. And they threw a ladder over the side, and uh, he did seem to have some kind of problem climbing up the ladder. And uh, the boatswain's mate went down to help him out. And he tried to put a knife in the boatswain's mate's shoulder. Now, he died of lead poisoning <laughs> quicker than <you'd, laughs> you can imagine. So we really never rescued anyone. But uh, that, that just kind of winds up my little talk. and. Uh, like I said before, uh, I've been unaccustomed to speaking to a nice group like yours, and I really think that it hindered me in my uh, occupation. I was a chemist for a good year. I went to school on the, on the GI Bill, and uh, I thought that was a good opportunity and whatever Franklin Roosevelt did, that was a, a good deal for anybody who really wanted to further their education. And it's, I'm, I'm sorry that a lot more guys didn't do it. So if you have any questions or that I might answer for you, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, as of now, it's, it's, I'm done. <laughs> Yes. You said you've upgraded a spotlight. Uh, I hadn't thought about that. Does that mean somebody would tell you where to point the spotlight? That you yes, the main battery director would tell me where to spot it and put it. It was, well, it was taller than I was. I mean, it was huge. And it was arc light. How many shipmates were on a destroyer? 310. And like I said, we lost 17 shipmates, uh, and there was another 21 or 22 cut purple hearts because they were had been injured. It. Uh, there's one thing about it, the Pacific Ocean is just one hell of a great big ocean. And I, I've, seen mo I've seen most of it. And these cruise ships that you see advertised, I have no desire to, to get on them. Enter the service. December 1943. So I had a pretty fast track to being on a warship and headed out to where the war was. Yes? You brought up MacArthur, I was just wondering what your opinion was, both 
back then and, and now of him? Well, I had, when I worked at Goodyear, I had one of the guys that was in the Army. Uh, he was in Hollandia, and they were all told, the whole unit, I don't know whether it was a, you know, a squad or a, you know, a regiment or what. They were all told they were going back to uh, uh, Pearl Harbor for rest and relaxation. And then they, uh, they ended up charging the beaches at Lady. And so they had no warm feelings for General MacArthur. I, I mentioned him <laughs> that I'd seen him, you know, going by the, you know, my ship, and uh, he just exploded <laughs> in his opinion of General MacArthur because they'd been told one thing and they were shipped somewhere else. Uh, we had one, one typhoon uh, there in uh, off Leyte, off Samar, and another one we went off of Okinawa where uh, we lost several, I think, LSTs and, and lost a couple of destroyers. Uh, it was an experience you won't forget. I, I know that I haven't. I, uh, I had a tendency to get seasick when things got rough, and uh, I uh, went my my watch station uh, aboard ship was in was in the prot room where the synchro senders and dividers and everything was down below, which you used to control the the five inch guns, and. Uh, these things now that you carry around in your pocket uh, had more electronics in it than that whole great big room did. And I mean, a synchro sender was, whoops, was that big and that big around, and they were all in a, you know, a container uh, three times the size of this desk here. And uh, that's where I stood my watch, and I went up to get some fresh air. Open the hatch, and nothing was out there but a wall of water. So I slammed the hatch and pulled down the dog's the dog ears, and uh, went back downstairs and was happy to <laughs> have a nice dry, warm place to, to go. Said after the bomb hit, there's a hole, I guess, on the side. Yeah, there, I've got, a, I've got a picture of it somewhere. Over there. Oh, oh, are they over there? Yes. Well, how did they patch the hole? Just weld them? Put yeah, on there? Ba patch on it. Working outside over the edge? Yeah. We almost lost it in that typhoon. The, the tug almost lost it. That they were their seagoing tug with welders on it. Uh, who were divers and everything. Uh, they almost lost it that night in the typhoon, but they they secured it and then put it back on the ship. Now, when we went to uh, back to Manus, where the uh, Admiralty's, where the dry dock was, uh, I've got a picture of the three ships in the dry dock. Uh, it's a floating dry dock that they put way down, and then, and then they'd pump all the water out of it, and you'd be, there would be three ships in that, that dry dock. So you have an idea of how, how big it was. Uh, a funny thing happened while we were in dry dock. I was working on the, uh, the drive on one of the twin 40s. I was back under it. Uh, I don't know who designed the, most of these things that were aboard ship, but they were always you know, lying on your back or, or standing on your head or, or, or doing something to get to where you wanted to be. 
and uh, this voice says, uh, do you know what you're doing in there, Sonny? It was my brother. He, his ship had pulled into Manus, and uh, he'd gotten permission to come over to see me. And he was a, he was a first uh, a chief uh, uh, radio man on an LST. I can't remember what the name or a number of it was, but I think there's one of these guys that was served on an LST here in the audience. Can you tell us something about the 50th reunion? Oh, it was in New Orleans. We had a wonderful time. <laughs> Since I'd been stationed down there, they want, everybody wanted directions for me as to where, where to go to have a good time. <laughs> Tell How many of you got to go to New Orleans? Oh, there were uh, about 28 of us, I think. Maybe one or two less, but I think there were 28 there. And I thought I'd, I'd put this shirt on tonight so that it would help identify who I am. I mean, where I was, and what we, what we did, and I, all of you that were in the service. I, I wear I wear this a lot of times, and I, I wear my cap a lot of times, so that uh, people often stop me. Uh, in the stores and, and so forth and talk to me about, you know, and, and I feel that, uh, I, uh, that uh, people who've been there and seen it and lived it should talk about it and t let everybody in this country know the hell that these guys went through. I mean that, that's the way I feel about it, and, and that's why I'm I'm up here t doing something that I really don't care to do. <laughs> but I feel that that people should know about all you guys that are out there fighting that war. Was the food any food? I can remember the first meal that we had aboard ship. And it was just after we left Bremerton, Washington, and we'd gone through the Straits of Juan de Fuqua up there to get back in, you know, out of in the ocean. We headed south, and I don't know whether any of you are familiar with the coastline of, of Washington and Oregon, but it very gentle. It goes to deep water, and the ship goes like this, and. When everybody went down to breakfast that day, they had pork chops swimming in grease. <laughs> and some of the shipmates did not make it into the chow line. They turned around and headed for the rail. <laughs> It was very upsetting, huh? <laughs> yes? How many officers did you have aboard ship, and what was your impression of the officer? How many officers did you have on ship, aboard ship, and what was your impression? Let me see. There must have been 24 or 25, and I was impressed with all of them but one, and he was, he was the torpedo officer. The uh, skipper had graduated from Annapolis, and he was second in his class. So we did, we did not have any, <laughs> any fault with him. He got, uh, I don't know whether, he got a silver star for sinking the battleship Yamashiro. But uh, it was a little upsetting uh, that uh, the whole
whole ship didn't get a presidential citation because we had made three torpedo runs. We'd sunk a Japanese battleship and it's gotten one hit on a, a light cruiser. So they're passing them out now, <laughs> it seems to me. But uh, yeah, the the or uh, the uh, the officers aboard ship were were fine, and they all they all knew their job except the one torpedo officer. He was always I don't know what screwing up I guess would be a, a term for it. And wouldn't you know he would. He came to all the reunions. <laughs> so I'll uh, I'll end this torture here and uh, wish you all a good, happy year. Okay. Thank you so very, very much. Okay, fine. For sharing this story with us. You've really taken us aboard. <laughs> okay. And the, the traditional Medina Library. Okay. Thank you, Toby. I, I, know, I know who can use that. Do you? Yeah. Who's that? He's sitting right there. Right there? <laughs> he's, a, he's a coffee fiend. A coffee fiend? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, would you give that to him? Okay.